Wouldn't it be great if your small business clients could offer big company benefits to their employees, plus automated payroll, compliance support, and HR tools? By using JustWorks, you can offer these four essential services to your clients via one simple platform. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, JustWorks, later in the episode. PPP, how can I explain it? I hope you will obtain it. If you listen, I will show you how to claim it. It's a program that they made for a virus called Corona. They give you free money because you got to stay at home. The first piece for paycheck, you may think you know what that is. Boss gives you moolah, shekels, lettuce, scratch, or cabbage. That part is true, but what if you are self-employed? Profit counts as payroll so your biz don't get destroyed. The other piece protection as a fiscal preservation. You can't pay no taxes if you're in liquidation. They're thinking too much, so remember 2.5. So when the curve flattens, we're all going to thrive. There's one more piece that we got to talk about. If you don't get with the program, son, you're going to be without. All the savvy players have friends at the bank to put them first in line when the program starts to crank. Grab your accountant and do your calculation to get the figures right for your loan application. If you use the proceeds for paying your team, your loan will be forgiven and you're going to scream. Get down with PPP. 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 It's amazing. Get down with PPP. Yeah. Isn't that, <laughs> he captured that like the whole history of everything, like the whole month. He just captured in one rap song. I love that so much. That was Steven Zellen. He's a CPA. He uploaded this video to his YouTube channel. That was just a part of it. Go watch the whole thing. He's got like almost 6,000 views in four days. We're recording on May 1st, but we're going to be talking about the month of PPP. I was looking at our past episodes and three... <laughs> Titles are all PPP, and this one's going to be it too, because it just keeps on going. What uh, should we inter- do our introduction? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Accounting Suite. Accounting Suite is cloud accounting software that acts like a customizable ERP system. It lets you start out with just the features you need today, and in the future, as your business grows, you can easily add Accounting Suite extensions to give you the features you need. A major strength of Accounting Suite is its robust set of inventory management tools to track inventory levels, orders, sales, and deliveries from anywhere at any time. Accounting Suite has an extension for multi-channel online sales. After connecting your online marketplaces, Accounting Suite will download all your transactions for you to approve prior to entry into the accounting system. It's similar to working with bank feeds. Accounting Suite is offering Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners 50% off forever by using the promo code CAP underscore 50 underscore 2020. To take advantage of this exciting offer and to learn more about how Accounting Suite offers an upgradable path for your firm and company's future, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ASuite. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash A-S-U-I-T-E. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. As firms everywhere are positioning themselves to work remotely, BQE Software is committed to supporting you and your employees during this critical time. BQE's core products operate 100% on a native cloud platform that's uniquely able to help you in your efforts to embrace remote work while maintaining your productivity. In response to the impact that COVID-19 has had on your firm and your clients' businesses, the team at BQE has let us know that Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners will now receive three months of BQE Core for free with an annual subscription package purchased on or before May 31st, 2020. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, we have something to celebrate before you jump into PPP. Okay, okay. Let's do it. We hit 200,000 downloads. Awesome. So thank you, listeners. Thank all of you for the support. The last, we're almost at two years, right? Getting very close. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's been an amazing run. 200,000 downloads is not anything to uh, squint about, right? I thought you were going to say $200,000, and we definitely haven't made that much money. No, 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 it's not that. (laughs) (laughs) It's just downloads, no, which, just you know, downloads. in this day and age, you might be able to use those to, to buy things. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, I know we have some reviews that we need to get to because we have, we had like a bug and we weren't getting the reviews. Yes. Yeah, so we've had two reviews. This is from Dwight Detloff. 
He says, five stars, love this podcast. There's a few that I listen to regularly, and this is one of them. As a solo practitioner, it's like having lunch or happy hour with other colleagues. Well, cheers to you, Dwight. And this one is also on Podchaser. It's five stars. It's from Liz Golightly. Love hearing you guys in Australia. We have fast-changing government deadlines here and legislation which has introduced so fast there is no consultation and included some and excluded others. Thanks for the updates. Looking forward to hearing more. Take care at this difficult time. So it sounds like uh, government is the same everywhere. <laughs> yes, I, I've been I've been watching on the sideline of what's happening a little bit in Canada, a little bit in the UK and, and in Australia, and their programs are causing just as much stress and pain for accountants as the PPP program is here in the states. So I, I'm it's good to it's good to hear we're all in the same boat worldwide. Well, let's get straight into it because there was a ton of news, a ton of drama when it comes to the PPP. There's a lot of blame going around now that people are starting to get really, really frustrated. You know, where do we even start with this? Well, where do we leave off last week? It was uh, when we were recording, the program was set to open up again on Monday. At 7.30 Pacific. Yeah. So it was about 10.30 uh, a.m. Eastern. We predicted the crash, which then followed. We predicted the crash when we recorded on Saturday. And then Monday, it crashed, I think, within 30 seconds. Yeah. No surprise there. Just too many applications trying to come in all at once. And the SBA's computer systems are terribly antiquated. <laughs> Some bankers were online live tweeting throughout the night their frustrations with trying to enter a single piece of information and then getting kicked out and having to go back in and information getting lost and having to re-enter it. And it just went on and on and on. And I think it's still a problem. I don't even know if it has been fixed at this point. I think people are just not even really talking about it anymore, but it's just still going on. They had to- Well, that's because they keep giving us gifts to talk about, but we'll, we'll talk about that more. Um, but apparently that first day though, they, they had 100,000 loans submitted on, on one day at the very first day. Yeah. But I mean, we're talking there's going to be you know another one to two million loans, actually way more than that because it should be smaller dollar numbers. So- Yep. You know, 100,000 loans when, you know, you're probably going to have, what, 3 million of them? It's not that good. It's going to take a whole month to get through. So what they tried doing is rate limiting. So banks could only submit so many loans per hour or per day or whatever. And then that didn't work. And people were really frustrated. Some of the smaller banks were really frustrated that the big banks were allowed to submit loans in batch files. And originally it was 15,000. So if you had 15,000 loans to submit, you could just dump them all into an XML file and submit that all at once. And you didn't have to go through this horrific process of entering them one by one. And then when the banks protested, the uh, Treasury or SBA lowered that to 5,000. But you know that still made a lot of small banks have to sit there just manually entering loan applications because they're only doing a few hundred. And you have to manually enter. Did you see the article um, in the Journal of Accountancy from Jeff Drew? No, no. So... They banned the use of RPA programs. So if you, if you were if you were smart and you had a keyboard automation tool that would fill out the online application for you, which you would do if you were smart and you want to type things in, they banned the use of those. So you <laughs> they basically said you have to manually type the data into the website. Unless you're a bigger bank, in which case you can just submit XML files. So then um, in order to, I guess, address some of that, they temporarily, like for a day, stopped the big banks from being able to submit and only the small banks could do it. But then that isn't exactly fair because a, a lot of the people who are at big banks, the small businesses who got neglected by the big banks at Chase and Wells Fargo and Citi and, and Bank of America, they're like, my loan still hasn't been processed. And, and you're giving preference now to small banks where that was clearly a success story for the first round. It's like none of it makes any sense. I think the the signal that you know maybe Treasury is starting to figure out that this is not going so smoothly is that uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin deployed his top deputy to the SBA to fix this thing, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, this is 27 days after this program started, and anyone who was paying attention could see this was going to be an issue. He sent um, Deputy Secretary Justin Muzinich, so we have Mnuchin sending Muzinich. To the SBA to sort this thing out. So we'll see. Hopefully he can uh, get things moving. Well, he's also announced, I saw earlier this week about they're going to investigate now or audit anybody that's done $2 million or more. Well, yeah. So now we're getting into the blame game, right? So 
small business owners are really frustrated. Accountants are really frustrated, but mostly those small business owners who don't have accountants, who aren't even fortunate enough to have accountants advocating for them, they're really mad. So who are they going to blame? Two weeks ago, we were blaming who? We were blaming the big banks, the bigger small businesses who got these loans like Shake Shack and uh, was Ruth Chris. And now Mnuchin tweeted today, quote, it has come to our attention that some private schools with significant endowments have taken PPP loans. They should return them. And he even went on TV and called for these big businesses, the public companies who have taken PPP loans, to not just return the money, but also apologize for even taking the money in the first place. This comes after the revised guidance. Was that even last week? Did we talk about that last week, the revised guidance? No. <laughs> the revised guidance as far as... The loans, like uh, what qualifies as needing the loan? Oh, yeah. They, they revised that. Yeah. Which we, that didn't, we didn't talk about that last week. I think that was new this week. Oh, God. That was so, new this so week? This week, you had the revised guidance. <laughs> right. So everybody's getting upset. They're all getting mad because these big businesses, these public companies are getting these loans. And so then Treasury comes out with the FAQ and revises the guidance and says, well, even though we excluded the requirement that you don't have access to outside capital, we actually meant that we wanted you to consider that. Right, because normally with SBA loans, you you can't get them in, if you have access to other capital, if you have a way to raise money outside of nor, you know the SBA. But they exempted all the businesses from that. Specifically, they did that on purpose in the legislation to speed things up. But now that they're seeing, oh, these big businesses, businesses that may not need it are getting the money. Uh, let's go back and change the rules. Well, I mean, that's been a lot of the big problem with this is right is the guidance keeps coming out. After the fact, after yes. the fact, after the fact. But I think he also yesterday, or maybe it was this morning, he said that they're going to now not just audit and look at loans that are above $2 million, They're going to start looking at every single loan. Like you're going to have to prove that you had some economic need. Yeah. I got an email from my old firm, from Armanino, and they talked about this and I couldn't believe it. But now that you're confirming that, I, I, I guess it must be true. So basically, the, the, the treasury is saying uh, they're going to audit well, they said on April 28th, they're going to audit all loans over $2 million to see if you know, the certification was correct, if they actually like, certified properly to this need or this necessity, I suppose. And, and the, you know, as we've talked about in the past, the, the, the certification is super, super broad, right? All you have to say is that current economic uncertainty makes the loan necessary to support ongoing operations. That could be anybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so then... Treasury Secretary Mnuchin says they're going to audit all loans greater than $2 million for compliance with the eligibility and calculation rules and the forgiveness and whatnot. And then the next day, so that was April 29th, apparently there's reports that he has now extended the audit threat to all borrowers regardless of the loan amount. And so all these accounting firms are now emailing their clients, you know, better make sure that you are comfortable with what you did and what we helped you do because they might audit you. And... Uh, to incentivize people to give back the money, the SBA is offering a limited safe harbor window. So if you return the money by May 17th to the bank, then there will not be any uh, ramifications. And what could that be? You know, That could be criminal penalties. I, I don't know about you, David, but this just seems insane to me. They gave out all this money with like hardly any strings attached. And now after the fact, they're saying, give it back or else? I mean, this all started, what was it, April 3rd, right? Was the beginning of this? Yes, it yes. got flipped on. So, so, so basically the entire month of April. And then the cherry on top, though, was late yesterday. Did you see the guidance announced late yesterday? The, the, IR, the IRS guidance? The IRS guidance yeah. that any money you spend the PPP loan on, you can't uh, expense it for your taxes. Right. It's not, dedu it's not deductible. Not deductible. Yeah. So, like, people are, this, I actually have never seen our community, like, get so furious. This is what this is the thing that actually like set everyone off. <laughs> it wasn't wait, 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 it, the the whole month like it couldn't have got like this just tip was the yeah. top of the cherry right. It's unbelievable how insane this month has been and the ridiculousness. And then they just topped it off with that. And like last night, you could see all the Slack channels are in. Like people just quit working debt yesterday. They just shut their laptops. They shut their computers. Like they just walked away and poured drinks. Yeah. Like it was like unbelievable month. And from the top it off with that ruling last night is just amazing. Yeah. Now, now I haven't been following all the tax implications of all this stuff, but my understanding is that the 
loan forgiveness that is going to happen is supposed to be tax free. And it is going to be tax free. They're not going to tax us. Like it's normally when you get a loan forgiven, it's a it's income, it's taxable, right? So this income is not going to be taxable. But then the IRS comes out and says, oh, but the deductions or the expenses associated with this uh, income uh, is not deductible, which is basically the same thing. Like if you, if they had just made the, the loan forgiveness taxable <laughs> and the expenses deductible, right, it's the same thing. It, it, it ends up making the money taxable. And so yeah, and, like, and when it's all said and done, so your loan that you got is probably really after in your brain almost think it's like really a loan for 75% of that when it's all said and done. So if you got a hundred thousand dollar loan, you really probably got a seventy five thousand dollar loan for free because you're paying taxes on that. Yeah, but you can't use the loan to pay your taxes. No. And so, so. But, but but from the <laughs> IRS standpoint, right, this or yeah. this this stimulus, right, is just they really didn't give out a trillion dollars. They only gave out Seven hundred fifty billion. Yeah, it's just it's a very backhanded way to like reduce the amount of you know, and it's going to create a lot of like horrible uh, conversations that now accountants have to have with their clients because we told them, oh, the money is tax free, and now we have to tell them actually it isn't. And you have to also tell them it may not get forgiven now either. Remember, remember two weeks ago I said like, watch they keep using this word potentially forgivable, and now. Like they, every week, every day, they chip away at that forgiveness. And two weeks from now, is it going to be, sorry, you can't forgive any of the loan anymore. We changed our mind. Yeah. Is it start? It feels like this. Well, it really feels like this. Uh, just to put things in perspective, I don't think they can do that legally. I don't even think that this guidance that they've issued would stand if this went to court. You, know, you can't just go back and change the terms after the fact. So if a, if a company took the money and certified and is willing to stand up to that, there's no case. The Treasury and the SBA don't have a case. But the problem it does create is the PR problem. Secretary Mnuchin going after individual businesses, like that's terrible. That could destroy your business if the public turns against you. I mean, Rubio even tweeted about how they're going to release the full list of PPP recipients. Did you see that? I did not see the tweet, but I mean, I think they should release who's been taking these loans. It's public information or it's public money. Like we should see this. I, I can agree with yeah, this. Yeah, but that but was never- I think it's going to be done very politically driven, right? I can see. Right. Well, I so I, the, first of all, that would be a terrible idea because it would you know talk about a witch hunt, right? And then it would also create problems for a lot of people who are, I think- supporters of the administration. And so then it provides fuel on both sides of the political debate. You know, there's there's plenty of folks who are, you know, donate to the Trump campaign who got this money. And and there's we've already seen evidence of that in the New York Times. There was a story here about a conservative Texas hotel owner who owns a, a ton of like hospitality businesses. And he used the loophole in the law, which is that each location just has to have fewer than 500 employees to get a ton of money. I mean, it's crazy. $126 million. So this is Monty Bennett. Uh, he applied through a network of entities for $126 million in forgivable loans from the Paycheck Protection Program. And according to company filings, has received $70 million of that as of May 1st. For comparison, Ruth Chris Steakhouse which is the second largest recipient, got just one-sixth that much and returned the money. And Monty Bennett is saying he's not going to give the money back. And he's saying he's likely not going to use the money in the eight-week period for payroll. He's going to hold on to it and keep it as a uh, non-forgivable 1% working capital loan, which you and I have talked about as being a strategy that many small business owners will likely take. So the money isn't going to go to payroll. It's going to go to helping them open up again when that's the, the, the economy improves. If you do get the money, right? Yeah. That's your worst case scenario. Is you have a loan for 1%, <laughs> which is pretty yeah, good. You can pay it back in two um, years and you don't have to pay for six months. So you could hunker down for six months and then start up again and use that money to help you start up again, which like to makes total sense as a business owner. <laughs> so- well, Maybe there's a hidden there's there's a hidden gem in this, right? I know we were upset and I was upset. Like the fact that these big huge companies are taking this money, yeah. right? Because ultimately that their their one loan could help two thousand small businesses, yeah. right? In a way. But now that this ruling came out with the 
the tax deduction, if it's dedu- not deductible, essentially, right? Like and you're saying, oh, somebody would have to fight this and and fight it, right? Right. And and, it would, and go to court over this. Well, maybe we need some of these huge companies that have lawyers and have taken massive amounts of money to fight that. Yeah. Right. The average small business yeah. owner is probably not going to be able to fight this on the whole. So. Maybe somebody will, but uh, I don't think they're going to go after Monty Bennett because he's a big donor. He's a conservative donor and has donated like $150,000 to the Trump campaign. So I think this puts Mnuchin in kind of an awkward position because here's the number one example of somebody who benefited from this program who you know, should not have, according to the intent of the rules. Apparently, he was like lobbying in Washington for these exemptions. And this makes like total sense, right? Like, Business owners who are kind of like on the big side of small hear about all this money that's going to come out, these you know billions and billions of dollars, and they want to get a piece of it. And they have interests in Washington. So they're working behind the scenes to change the legislation. This is lobbying, right? This is how it always works, to make sure that they qualify. So they got this exemption put in place. I'm not saying it was this guy in particular, but it was probably a bunch of them all lobbying for exemptions together. So you know, while this law is being drafted, they get that put in there. So that they can qualify, even though in aggregate they have more than 500 employees, they can still get the money. And I think this was like a political miscalculation by whoever was drafting the law. Uh, they figured, okay, well, some big businesses are going to get the money, but there's going to be so much of it and everybody's going to get money that nobody will care. But then we had the computer problems and the slow rollout of the program and the money not getting out. And then people are getting really, really mad and they have to blame somebody. So who do you blame? Treasury is not going to blame itself. And and you know who do people love to get mad at? They love to get mad at big banks and they love to get mad at big businesses. And so the, that's who's become the target of all of these attacks. But like honestly, if you're out there attacking them, which you know there's a lot of people doing that, like Gene Marks, you know he's the number one influencer CPA. He's like all over the news, probably the most visible CPA in the world. And He's writing all these articles. Uh, I'll read the headlines for two of them. Shake Shack handed back its $10 million loan, but that's no reason to applaud, going after basically Shake Shack for even taking the money in the first place. And then he wrote another article, America's big banks should be ashamed of themselves and just going after the big banks. Like, you know, and I know it's fun to do that. We've taken part yeah, in some right. of this, right? Like, I get that. But I, I'm, I'm less mad at the people who got money as much as the, the, over celebration by the Treasury and the SBA about how great this program is, even though there's just flaws right. everywhere. Just, just stop trying to celebrate this as a victory. It's not a victory. It's just not. Yeah, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that all of this blame game on the businesses that took the money and the banks, it's all just a distraction. It's 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 a distraction from the real problem with the program, which we have talked about since the very beginning of. The, of all of this. It's the the way it was structured in the first place and the the way it was rolled out through the SBA and the banks who just don't have the computer systems in place, the technology to deal with this kind of volume. Well, and nobody's talking about that. You don't have people like writing articles, you know, like that's what I would love to see. Like a guy like, you know, Gene Marks with his platform, like expose the real problem here. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by JustWorks. JustWorks is a combination of simple software and expert support for payroll, benefits, HR, and compliance, all in one place. This combination makes it easier for accountants, bookkeepers, and outsourced CFOs to help their clients run their businesses more smoothly and access great benefits for their employees. With JustWorks, your clients get access to affordable benefits, automated payroll, HR tools, and compliance support for ever-changing employment regulations. Should you, your clients, or their employees ever have any question about benefits or payroll, you can call JustWorks anytime, really anytime. The -the round-the-clock support team is standing by with dedicated support just for accountants. JustWorks is simple and fast. It has an easy-to-use dashboard, integrations with QuickBooks and Xero, and additional automated tools to serve the modern workforce. Ready to give JustWorks a try? For a limited time, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get two free months of JustWorks service. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash JustWorks. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash J-U-S-T-W-O-R-K-S. JustWorks, focus on your business, we'll focus on the rest. Speaking of platforms, 
there's news that just broke after we started recording. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump on this article right now, which is <laughs> really, that? so I'm going to rewind to news from about two hours ago first. So obviously with this program, there's constant confusion. So now the latest confusion, I don't know if you've seen is when do we start counting our eight weeks? Do we start counting it on the day of our next payroll? Do we start counting it when we get, when we get the um, money? Do we start counting when our city or town has lifted the stay at home orders? Like when do we start the eight week count? So the AICPA has er, uh, came out with their guidance, which they should align with the beginning of the pay period, not the date of the loan proceeds are received. They also say it should not even start. It should be flexible to when the business chooses to open again. Mm -hmm. Finally, because I felt like the ACPA has been a little not swinging their sword. They've been a little soft with a lot of recommendations. And now they're, they're, they're changing to urging. They could, they're not recommending things anymore. Well, mm -hmm. 33 minutes ago. So after we pressed the record button, the AICPA has taken a position on the tax deduction. Oh, what are they saying? So I'm going to read the quote here. The AICPA believes strongly that the IRS's interpretation denying deductions of expenses forgiven under the PPP program is contrary to Congress's intent. This is uh, Chris Hesse, CPA chair of the AICPA Tax Executive Committee. Yes, good. Take, take a stand because that is just – what has happened here is ridiculous. And so the, the AICPA plans to seek legislative clarification. So cheers to the ICPA, who I I really have felt they've been too soft along this whole path on this. Are finally like had an it, like it hit the like I think last night it, like it hit it finally hit the peak for everybody, and even the AICPA finally hit. Yeah, they're like this is complete shit. We have to do something now. You know when it becomes an actual tax issue, that's <laughs> that's when that's when CPAs get really mad, right? Oh man. With that said, I got approved for my PPP loan. Hey, congratulations, David. I So I filled out the website with a small local lender, what, April 4th? That was the Saturday. Mm -hmm. Heard nothing the whole first round, nothing. Then the day before the second round basically got turned on, I heard back. I filled stuff out, didn't hear anything. And then yesterday, because they, they made that window and they turned it off for all the big banks, I got approved like that. And then um, I talked to some uh, another accountant this morning and she said, yeah, everybody that she knows that has small ones, it's finally going through. Mm. So things are starting to go through. But it was funny, even last night before I got the email, I was just like, this thing, I, I kind of just want to like stop even worrying about it now. And then it, <laughs> it went through as soon as I was about ready to be done with it. You've been waiting almost a whole month. You applied as soon as it started. Yeah, it was the first, it was one of the few websites I found that was working. That's that crazy. Apply. <laughs> wow. And I wonder how much money has actually gotten out to small businesses like we, that. We were really all over that at the beginning, but then like I kind of gave up because SBA doesn't track it and they aren't releasing information on it. So we still, you know, we have anecdotal evidence the money's getting out finally, but we still don't know just how much has been approved versus how much has been dispersed. There is no <laughs> data on that a month after the program started. <laughs> Payments.com did have a, a survey of 1,200 small businesses. And so they're looking at about how many SMB owners have applied for PPP loans and the different stages. So 35% have a, been approved but have yet to receive the funds. My application has been filed but has not been approved is 31%. I've applied and I received funds is about 30%. And then 2.5% or almost 3% um, were application was denied. So about a th at best, a third of the money has been put into somebody's bank account. Oh, wow. That's worse than I thought it would be. I was hoping it would be at least half. So a month later, a third of the money is in the accounts. And we're probably going to need more. I think you talked about an estimate on the last episode that we're going to need $900 billion to actually fund all these applications? Yeah, somebody from Bank of America was talking about that. So here's a question I have. I've been, I've been thinking about this, David. Um, when it comes to the PPP money, like actually not just getting to businesses, but actually helping people stay on payroll. I want to kind of give you a hypothetical situation. Like pretend I'm a business owner and I don't really care. I'm going to act in my own self-interest, right? Let's take that as an example. So I get this PPP money. Let's say I get $100,000 and I'm going to use 75% of that on payroll. Now, I have a choice. I, you know, I was going to lay off maybe 10, 20% of my workforce because my revenue is down 10, 20%. So I could keep them and I could pay them using that money or I could do what I was going to do before and lay them off. So let's say I lay them off, even though I got the money. What that means is that 
Now, let's say it's I lay off 20% of my workforce. So $80,000 can get forgiven still though, because I'm still paying 80% of my employees and 80% of the payroll. So then in that case, the other 20%, the $20,000 just turns into a loan at 1%. And I could just pay that money back. So in that case, did the program actually do anything? There's no, there's no disincentive to not lay people off, I guess. Like you can always just take the money as a small loan. Does this make sense? Yeah. And I think uh, the same thing, those surveys from payments address some of that too. The, some people were just taking it as a cash cushion, like 25%, just in case. Oh, really? Yeah. I got to look at this survey. Wow. But, you know, generally, uh, you know, 25, 30% said if they don't get it, they won't survive at all. Right. Um, another about half, close to 40 to 50%, you know, are in that range area are pushing like, hey, if they don't have it, they wouldn't keep, be able to keep their employees until they're ready to reopen. So, so I think it, it is helping some small businesses keep employees until they're able to reopen for X eight weeks. Right. But we're already five weeks in, six weeks in. <laughs> yeah. Like, like by the time people get this, it's just and, so late and it just took so long. Well, and as a reminder, like the name of the program is Paycheck Protection Program. That's what it's supposed to be doing. So is it is it actually doing that is my question. So I know some well, part of this I've been feeling is the Congress is out of touch. The fact that they think restaurants have 500 employees, they rate these things in. And, and some part of me questions like, do they even care about small business? I'm going to reinforce this. So you're, you're aware of the Main Street Lending Program, right? Mm, yes. Um, that's the next one for the larger businesses. Yes. Right? But like, what do you normally, when people talk about Main Street USA, what size businesses are you usually talking about on Main Street USA? Well, normally I'm thinking about like the mom and pop retail stores, like the hardware store or something. Small businesses. So yeah. They, they, so they create a program for businesses that have uh, up to 10,000 employees, right? So this is the 500 to 10,000 employee bracket of businesses, yeah. right? That, that have revenues, uh, revenues up to 2.5 billion in sales. And they call it the Main Street Lending Program. Like how out of touch are they? Like this should be called like yeah. almost Fortune 500 Lending Program. <laughs> It should be called the uh, the big box lending program, and then they should have called the paycheck protection program the Main Street lending program. They're just completely out of touch with with what's out there in the world. It's 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 sh it's so shocking to me, and, and it's not just Republicans; it's also Democrats. Oh yeah, let's not forget. Like we've gotten some criticism lately for you know being skewed politically, which I think is funny because I would not consider myself to be a liberal in the slightest. You know, I just hate waste. I hate uh, inefficiency. I hate programs that don't work. And, you know, the Democrats bear just as much of the blame for this legislation as the Republicans, given that it passed unanimously. Like, all it would have taken is one person to stand up and say, hey, guys, maybe this isn't a, such a good idea. And nobody did. So I, I, I think there's equal blame to go around, both the, the Democrats and the administration and the Republicans in Congress and the Senate. And actually, I, you know who I feel – the worst for in all this is the poor people that are working at the SBA. I mean, it must suck to work there right now. Can you imagine? There are even, it's, I mean, people that are processing the bank loans, right? And manually yeah. typing these into the SBA website. Oh, oh my God. I mean, even obviously we've talked about accounts and bookkeepers that are suffering like across the board. And then I'm, I'm, the IRS as well, right? People at the treasury. So yeah. Yeah, this is not like, the, this is definitely being political, politicized at the highest levels. And it's going to continue to be like, there's no end in sight to this. There, yeah. Well, and that's the problem is that like, if it, if we could just avoid politicizing it and just deal with the actual fundamental issue, which is that like they wrote the law wrong, then we could get around this better. But um, the fact that nobody wants to own up to it and just wants to point fingers at other people, that's, that's the big problem here. It just keeps going. And, 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 yeah. and I, I feel what, one thing that drives me nuts about this is it's bad enough. We have this virus that, there's no end in sight, right? They're like, nobody, everybody has to just, they have this unknown in their life. But then the stimulus package to some extent is created just as much unknown. It's actually worse because it gave everybody a bunch of hope. Like, hey, there's gonna be these loans and they're gonna be tax free yeah. and you're gonna be able to, we're gonna get them out within 10 days, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. And then even people's stimulus checks. What we last week, we talked about half the people still have not received their stimulus money, right? So people just have all this, non-predictable things happen in their life and you'd think of anything, yeah. the financial part could be stabilized by just 
being consistent and being smart how we do this, but it's not. There's no end in sight to this. Like we'll have a cure for COVID before we this gets figured out. It's possible. It is unlikely, but possible. Oh man. I don't know. Any other any other PPP news? No, and honestly, I have like no energy to talk about anything else other than that <laughs> There's issue a, today. Oh, Windows update crack making QuickBooks desktop crash. Well, why the hell are people still yeah, on so QuickBooks I, desktop? I Please just get off it. I didn't really uh, talk about that. Just, just do it. So you have a uh, – there's an air show in Phoenix. So you, we got to get off because we're not going to be able to record it anymore. There's some jets that are going to be flying over the city in about 20 minutes. And my five-year-old son really is going to enjoy watching that. So I got to do that. But also, yeah, this would be incredible. Are they going to be throwing out billions of dollars of stimulus money out the window? Of the jets, so that way that would be really cool. The efficient way to distribute. Uh, no, it's in support of our first responders. So um, that's the it's it, they're they're not going to be throwing out money. They're going to be throwing out hope. So uh, I'm going to go watch that and and have a nice rest of my Friday. And I hope you do too, David. Yeah. So if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? I am at Blake T Oliver on Twitter. And how about you, David? I'm at David Leary. You can also follow the Cloud Accounting Podcast on Twitter. Their cloud. ACCT pod or just search for cloud accounting podcast. I did create a survey. Was this the worst April in the history of accounting? So I'd love if you went to that survey and said yes or no. Hey, um, I realized I forgot to read some listener mail before we um, stopped recording last week. So I want to get this uh, on the record. Is that That's all right? a good way to close this out. Perfect. All right. So this is from Greg Baramian, subject value pricing. Hi, Blake. I've been listening to the podcast for approximately six months. You and David are awesome speakers, and I learned so much in every podcast. We applied for the PPP program on April 7th with Chase and never heard anything and just found out the funds are exhausted. Question for you regarding value pricing. I started my practice 26 years ago and was a solo most of the time just doing tax prep and some tax planning and consulting in the off-season. I am an EA and specialize in tax only. I learned from my first job at H&R Block to charge by the form. I have done that for 26 years. I am hearing a lot about value pricing, but I don't think it would apply to a tax only business. In our firm, we don't have many high net worth clients, and most of our clients only want to see us once a year or if they have a job change or increase income and need planning. They just come in for a consult visit where we charge hourly. We do work year round and we are trying to grow the tax resolution side of the business as I love standing up to the IRS. Just curious about your thoughts with a value pricing model for a business that only does tax. Thank you and looking forward to the next podcast. Stay safe and be healthy. So if any of you have any advice for Greg, feel free to um, tweet at us. So here's what I think, Greg. I think that there's an opportunity here to bundle the tax prep with audit support. I mean, this is what like TurboTax has done forever, right? David, H&R Block, like you pay an extra fee and then they'll defend you. Oh yeah, at the end you get to get it. It's almost like buying a little insurance policy. Exactly. And honestly, that's what value pricing is, right? If you listen to Ron Baker, or Ed Class talk about value pricing, it really is in a way an insurance policy against future work that you might have to pay for. So try bundling in all that unpredictable stuff, the tax planning, the audit prep into the tax uh, prep and then maybe spread that out over the year. So you could charge people like, you know, in two installments instead of at the end, or you could charge them quarterly or, or even every month if, if you wanted. Uh, and that way they know, hey, if I have a question, I just call, I pay a little extra, but I'm not going to get hit by an hourly bill. So, you, you know, you have to model that out and see, make sure you're not going to get too overwhelmed with the work that comes in and you're not billing for it. But, you know, there's ways to uh, protect yourself with, you know, limits. You could set a limit and say like, you know, this will not exceed, you know, so much or, or different things, which is, you know, that's what the software guys do, uh, on that audit uh, defense stuff. This is just my take and thanks for writing in and, uh, anyone else, if you want to, you know, leave us a message or well, you can email us. I'm Blake at blakeoliver.com. Or what's even better is you could call us because we love to hear our listeners voices you can call us at 202-695-1040. That's 202-695-1040. It's a Google voice number that we set up that goes straight to voicemail. Just leave a voicemail and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Let us know your opinion. Let us know a question. Uh, We will listen to it and maybe we'll play it on the air. And uh, good luck to another uh, four weeks probably of PPP madness. Talk to you soon, David. Bye. 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 
time for the classifieds. If you want to learn how to make video tutorials from an expert, sign up for Hector Garcia's live webinar, How to Make Video Tutorials, so you can learn how to create content to educate your team, your clients, and your prospects. Use coupon code CAP50 for $50 off your purchase. Head over to www.hectorgarcia.com slash tutorial. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? Automate this process and get client answers instantly with Client Hub's QuickBooks Online integration. This feature was described as one that only an accountant would have come up with as it solves a real big pain point. Client Hub is a modern client portal designed for cloud accounting firms. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Are you looking to get some of the best content in the world to improve your team and your firm and some free CPA credits too? Good news, the Accounting Salon has turned into a virtual event called Salon V and it's open to the world. You can register for free at accountingsalon.com. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.